Welcome everybody to uh, the third day of the GNU Tools Track at the Linux Plumbers Conference 2021. I go through a little bit of uh, the, the housekeeping just to uh, thank all of our sponsors again this year for the Linux Plumbers Conference, the diamond sponsor of Facebook, uh, IBM is platinum sponsor, uh, gold sponsors of ARM and Microsoft, uh, silver sponsors of Amazon, AWS, Netflix, and Red Hat. Uh, and speaker gifts were provided by Collabora. Uh, and uh, t-shirts will be provided by VMware. That if people respond, the, the first I think is 100 or so at the end of the, uh, the conference. Um, and of course, the, the conference services have been provided and, and hosted by the Linux Foundation. We want to thank uh, the Linux Foundation and the, uh, the great effort by uh, all of the members of the uh, planning and steering committee, uh, including uh, Elena, who's who's on this call as well, uh, James Bottomley, Keith Stewart, uh, Chris Browner, uh, Guy Linari, uh, Steve Rosette, Jonathan Corbett, uh, and also wanted to have a special thanks and, and shout out to uh, Embicosm and uh, Jeremy Bennett and uh, Sarah uh, Cook from Embicosm for helping to lead the great effort in the program committee for uh, the GNU tools track itself and helping to provide all the administration. So thank you very much to, uh, to both Linux Foundation and Embicosm for all of their great support uh, with this effort so that we can have a successful GNU tools track this year. So thanks everybody for that. Um, now, if, uh, let's see, how do, uh, Sarah can help with uh, switching over to the, uh, the next presentation. Uh, so we'll start out uh, this year with the uh, GNU tool chain, uh, GNU GCC steering committee, and uh, GNU tool chain stewards uh, event this year, the Q&A panel. Um, so we have some uh, people both uh, on the call here and uh, the uh, number of, and some people from the, the steering committees and the stewards lurking. Actually, myself, David Edelson, I'm on the uh, GCC Steering Committee. Uh, Carlos O'Donnell from GLibC Steward, Jason Merrill, who is in the GCC Steering Committee, Jeff Law in the GCC Steering Committee, uh, and we have at, at least Joseph Myers, who's on both the uh, GLibC and GCC, though uh, not uh, listening in for this. So just give people a little bit of background about uh, sort of the status of what's happening, uh, the incredible development activity that we've had this year in all of parts of the GNU tool chain. Uh, GCC has had almost you know, 10, 9,000, almost 10,000 commits with 372 different developers in terms of the GCC. GDB bin utils repository had 4,582 commits by 209 developers. GLibC had 1,664 commits by 139 developers. So there's a lot of incredible activity and a lot of great progress in all of these projects. Um, so it's really exciting that we have such a, a thriving community um, that's the basis for uh, the Linux and cloud ecosystem. So it's great that we continue to drive forward with the, the tool chain that's the basis for Linux distributions and many of these hybrid cloud efforts. Um, and also thank out to the great work by our uh, Google Summer of Code students, at least for GCC, we had Arthur Cohen working on Cargo Tool for Rust. Um, Ankur Sayani for uh, extending the C++ support for static analysis and Wajang Yang for the static analysis of unreachable function. So that was great uh, progress in GCC from Google Summer of Code students and, and highlights. Uh, this is just what I picked out. I mean, Carlos can, can jump in with other things, but great work that has happened in the past year for GLibC with uh, tunables, hardware capabilities, uh, the coalescence of many of these different uh, dependent libraries, including libp threads into libc. Um, of course, a lot of architecture specific improvements in GCC, C++20, a lot of great improvements for OpenMP, and of course, optimizations work by uh, you know, many of the incredible developers, especially uh, uh, Richard Beener at, uh, and uh, for all of the, uh, the great leadership that, that he and, and Joseph Myers have done as uh, and, and Jakob Jelinek as the release managers for GCC. Uh, of course, GCC Rust and the Rust GCC Code Gen GCC, which hopefully people heard about or can go back and hear about uh, from the uh, 
Linux Plumbers Conference uh, uh, referee track. We have great presentations on the first day. Uh, Bin Utils switching over to a C99 as the, the basic uh, required language, and of course, lots of architecture improvements and uh, GDB support from, again, from, from Oracle and uh, Jose uh, for BPF, all that great infrastructure that's been put into the entire GNU tool chain and lots of uh, UI improvements for GDB. So lots of incredible work this year for the entire tool chain, which we really appreciate all of the developers. And uh, so that's sort of my summary of what's been happening. So now, open it up to, to great questions from the audience. Um, so what people want to hear about for the, uh, the leadership of the uh, GNU toolchain. Um, David, I was going to say, um, if, if one of the, one of the extra things I, I did want to talk about here, I didn't get a chance to add anything to the slides. My apologies, um, is CI CD for the GNU toolchain. So um, there is a bunch of CI CD work that we are trying to do to really bring up and bootstrap an initiative for the GNU tool chain based on patchwork, based on container deployments. Uh, DJ Delore, who's on uh, our team here at Red Hat, is working on CI CD. And for over five months, we've been doing hundreds of CI CD reg tests as glibc patches arrive to the mailing list. And it's interesting because, uh, like, uh, you know, from a GNU toolchain leadership perspective, I think CI/CD is one of those pieces that we in the toolchain are kind of missing. And when you have CI/CD, it really gives developers that confidence to submit a patch. And for glibc right now, we are running a linter, so you submit your patch, and the linter automatically gives you some status of whether the patch applied. And we're going to extend that a little bit, and um, it automatically runs a 32-bit x86 build. Just because it's an architecture that you know we we is not as often tested as let's say an x86 64 make check. Um, so for five months we've been doing this for glibc, and it's being like functionally driven through uh, patchwork, which is on the side of the mailing list. And so from from my perspective, I really think this is high value for the GNU toolchain to look at CI/CD testing, uh, specifically try bots for patches in order to assist maintainers and reviewers, largely because reviewers have limited resources in their day in getting a lot of green successes on a patch that has just gone in, you can immediately see, oh, has it built across all the variance architectures I want? Has it built across a specific configuration I'm interested in? And more than that, we're looking at uh, reviewer-driven CI/CD, where if you're a maintainer of glibc or binutils or GDB or, or GCC, that you basically can send the list a signed message saying, hey, Tribot, I want this additional test to run. And so you respond to a patch saying, Tribot, tell me, did this thing run on this configuration? And the Tribot, knowing who you are with your GPG clear sign request, will potentially run, uh, run a build. So um, I'm really keen as a as like a, G, a GNU toolchain developer to see that CI CD work extend across uh, all of the GNU tool chain. So that's that's kind of where I see there's a lot of high value across the across the GNU tool chain in the coming year for CI CD for accelerating that the capacity that reviewers have. I know for people that have been to the glibc boff, I always talk about this. I'd love to be able to review 100 patches in a day. And the an previous answers at the last two cauldrons have been drugs and no sleep. And I said, no, we have to make it possible not with drugs and with some sleep that I can review 100 patches in a day. I think CI/CD is one of those things where um, you <laughs> there's the potential for us to to really look at a lot of patches in in one day. Um, so that that's what I wanted to say today uh, to talk about CI/CD in the GNU toolchain as a whole. We've started with glibc because it's something useful. We've actually just turned on patchwork uh, on Sourceware for um, for GCC patches. We already have Ooh. binutils in there, and we already have GDB in there. And I know Jonathan Wakely has been tagging some patches as reviewed because, like, having a list of patches is really useful. And also, um, Git PW, which is the patchwork command line client, lets me automatically just say, Git PW, give me that series, applies it to my, my Git tree, and then I can immediately start testing it. So that's, that's it for me. So, Carlos, you and I need to get together. Um, I have moved my GCC tester into a Docker framework. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that uh, if you've got patchwork 
sitting on the GCC list, all we need to do is wire these two things together at this point. We, that's what we did with DJ. So what we do with the tribots is the tribots are effectively, uh, we're using Podman, but Podman or Docker doesn't matter. Yeah. Same You're, end. Basically what happens is um, Patchwork gives you an event queue. You, we then have a curator that listens to the event queue and, and curates those messages. And then you've got individual runners. And so the intent would be that IHVs, ISVs that are interested in putting together a, uh, a tribot, you basically run your test and then you contribute the upstream success warn or fail to the checklist. So when you as a reviewer are looking at a patch uh, and you're looking at the results for the data, you get the aggregate success warns or fails of all the interested parties that were looking at those patches arriving on the mailing list with their tribots running. And a tribot is effectively just a, a runner with a local, it's just a, it's just a local runner with an AMQ that basically runs in the container. Um, DJ can talk more about that. There's a little bit of hardening you have to do because the container has to run with the network off because when you run a dry bot <laughs> that takes random patches from the mailing list and runs it, you want to make sure that it doesn't, it isn't capable of carrying out arbitrary computation whose results can be returned to the user in a way that's meaningful on the mailing list so that they, you know, mine bitcoins using our mailing list. But <laughs> I'm sure we'd all catch on pretty fast if that happened. So, yeah. <laughs> And Joseph, anyway, yeah, you, you, DJ, and I should get together on, on this topic. Yeah, and, Joseph, your comments yes, together. A, a build many glibcs bot running after commits, um, but doing it as a try bot for all post dispatches would need a lot of compute resources. Joseph, so um, to answer Joseph's question, this is really the concept of uh, reviewer driven CI CD, where if you see a patch land on the list and you're like, that patch touches a public header, so you say at build try bot build many glibcs, Tribot sees that as a, as a request and drops an event in the queue that says, Carlos has requested a build many glibcs for this, this patch, uh, for this message ID patch, basically. And so that would, for example, be a way in which you could kick off resource intensive CICD steps. So you can run a build many glibc. Build many glibc, for those of you who don't know, in the, in the GNU tool chain, within glibc, we have a script that basically builds every ABI variant, something like 72, 75 ABI variants, all the cross compilers, all the host libraries, all the glibcs, all the bin utils, everything gets built. It all gets run down to the bottom and it all gets compared under like a regression test for glibc basically. And so what we're looking for is build fails across one of the architectures or in other places. So it is hugely compute intensive. And um, yeah, Florian, DJ and I often we, we spec out machines to see how fast a machine can run build many glibcs and we have this this ongoing list of like what's the fastest box today that we can get a, you know 72 cross target ABI builds done as fast as possible to make sure that things still build um, you need a lot of CPUs so um, so for for, <clears throat> for GCC what would be the, the criteria of a pass in the fail of the CICD. You tell me. Well, it's difficult. I, I can't. I, well, it, it builds, maybe. Sure. So right now, Richie, I, the way I would approach that would be, does the test compare script in our contrib directory for whatever target we choose to run it on give you a regression failure? That is the definition right now in a tester. Yeah, so, so you actually need to build twice. Yep. Yeah. Well, actually, you, you save the artifacts in the current mode. So the last build, you, you always save the last successful build, and you can compare against that for a regression. So this takes almost 10 hours per target. No, not even close. Well, it does. No, because I'm running it all the time. <laughs> it does uh, not take 10 you, hours per target. It, any, uh, it, you, a, a, an embedded you, target you, takes about one hour. Then you run the test suit in cross compile mode. It doesn't do like ninety percent of the test. Then. So for a cross target, it takes about an hour. For a for a native x eighty six, takes two to three on the hardware that I've got. Uh, for two builds. No, you do one build and compare against the last successful build. Okay. Okay. I mean, there is no doubt that some of these things are computationally expensive, um, and they will require some compute resources, and that is uh, going to be an ongoing conversation. But it's it's an ongoing conversation, yeah. and there are 
organizations that can help. So the last um, yep. two or three years, uh, Amazon has given us uh, credits in AWS to run tests. They, I, and I, I just apply for them, they give them to me, and I, oh, okay, I'll ship the stuff to Amazon. Um, it's, it's like $5,000 a year. It's not a huge amount of money, but it's enough you can run a small little farm in there. But, but so there are, there are resources out there. We, we are supposed to save the planet, right? <laughs> yeah, and, this is not and, conducive to that. And we are saving the planet by making the best FOSS tool chain that there is and using that FOSS tool chain to build products that will save the planet. But we need to build a robust, reliable tool chain so that other people can build things and have them not fail and have them save the planet. So we're just helping people save the planet. Um, yeah, I mean, so CICD, I mean, glibc is a lot easier to build. Um, and I looked at, I'm looking at GCC patches now because it's one of these things where, like, if we can scale to GCC patches in terms of some compute resources and putting that together, then it works. Now, the nice thing about patchwork is it's a centralized repository where success warn fails for, for recording the check results. We can distribute the, ch the checkers in as many runners as we want and as many different hosts and setups as we want. But I don't, I don't want to hog all the time. I just wanted to make, uh, make a comment that I, th I see, you know, we've made forward progress on, on full CI/CD for the GNU tool chain. And I want to keep that moving forward. And I will for glibc. I'm, you know, I'm going to talk to uh, the rest of the GNU tool chain components to say, you know, how can we help? Is there anything we can do? Is there anything of value? Is there anything that fits into your workflow? And, um, uh, the 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 integrative, you know, pre like pre, -pa pre like patch submission try bots have like I think have a lot of value because right away um, when something fails, I can say as a reviewer, I'm like I'm not going to review that, and I'll send the person a message and I'll say, you know, this thing's is broke, it's not working on this thing, and then they go, oh my god, I didn't even know that was a didn't even know that would work that way, and so um, yeah, it it has it yields the highest value for me as a reviewer. Um, Neil Gumpa asks, uh, is there something like a build bot planned? Um, so, uh, I, like, this is uh, one of these hemming and hawing things about, uh, like, post-commit checking versus pre-commit. And I think the patch try bots on the mailing list, in my opinion, have immense value. Yes, there is value to check more things once you do a commit. But once you do the commit, you're already interrupting other people's workflows. And so I feel like from, you know, we have to bite the bullet in building something that is operationally secure and is capable of testing patches as they arrive on the mailing list. So I, I just looked at the patchwork um, and I see uh, that yeah, entries like patches sent from me, but they are in between committed into the repository. So patchwork doesn't cross check with the repository for patches that have been pushed. Not by default, but we have pat we have uh, patchwork bots that do that for glibc, and it's basically a script that goes in and does the does the cross checking and marks things as committed because you can mark the entries as committed when you're done. So we can you can do a little more integration, and the reason the integration is left up to us is because we need to decide what workflow works best for each of the communities. Um, <laughs> right, Sadesh says right now he's the bot that runs this for GLC. Yeah, so he's totally the bot that runs it for GLC. Um, yeah, so that's that's where we are with the with the commit because each community could have a slightly different process that happens when something gets committed. So Jakob raised a question about um, patches slightly changing before commit. I'm going to call this out as a bad habit, right? Changing your patch before commit is simply a bad habit. What you post is what you should commit. Now, that may not be what you're doing today. And if you don't do that, you know, I hope you feel a little bit of shame and you say, yeah, it's a bad habit, but, you know, I, I like biting my nails and, you know, I, I got to get out of the habit, but it's hard not to change things before I commit it, you know. And we found very quickly that, like, for transparency, for honesty, for being clear with people submitting their patches, what you push should be what they gave you. And that's something that you know, we really want to stick to. Well, I think you tie that into the, the uh, longer term, we tie that into a patchwork flow. 
a reviewer mm -hmm. has run through patchwork, the reviewer has looked at the code, he clicks the button and says, that's good. And so what was in patchwork goes into the tree. Mm -hmm. and, if you, and if you have to ask somebody needs to make an adjustment, they make an adjustment and it goes through that process again. Yeah, and I often just ask people, I say, oh, send, me, send me a new V10 and I'll just, I'll act that one because it'll have all the final changes just to double check. Um, one of the interesting benefits of patchwork is um, in glibc, we're trying to track reviewed by. So track reviews, right? Give, give credit where credit is due where people, when people are reviewing things. And um, Git lets you aggregate, like, who is the reviewers? Who is doing a good job? Who should I be thanking? Who should I be... Who should I be encouraging to do more review and that kind of thing, which is part of community building. It's part of encouraging the volunteers to become reviewers. Because we'll all be honest, review is a thankless job. But when you get your rev like, I admit that there is some, uh, you know, there's some good feeling when you see your name in the reviewed by line and you feel you feel thanked for the fact that you did a ton of reviews. Um, and so the reviewed by lines actually get aggregated by Patchwork for you if you're using the Patchwork client to pull down the M boxes and, and Git AM apply them. Um, and so you don't have to even bother. Like if you got five reviews and you Git AM out of a, a Git PW pull for the for the Patchwork series, Patchwork will watch that that thread, know that a bunch of people gave you those reviews, it will aggregate them for you, put them into the commit message, and then it automatically just gets pulled into the thing you applied as reviews. So then the, the reviewers get thanked and the reviewers, and you, you just give that little bit of kudos to those reviewers to say, hey, you know, I've recorded your review. Thank you very much for the, the work that you did. And Jakob is posting about, uh, you know, patch changes, uh, nits fixed and things like that. So Jakob says, a repost in another review is unnecessary. Um, I, yeah, it is unnecessary, but it makes... Well, I think for that yeah. case, you it, the, we could have a fast path through the system. If I've said, fix this comment, mm -hmm. all you want to do is verify things build, and you only need to pick one target to verify they didn't forget to close the comment or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there should be, you know, we, we should be able to build in a fast path that just says, build a cheap, easy target. It builds, okay, so that, you know, they fix the nits and let's move on. Yeah, I... I agree. Yeah. And I think if, if you're the more automation you do, the more you want crisp boundaries around this is the thing that I okayed to go in and it went in exactly like I said it would go in. Um, and so sometimes it just is a matter of the reviewer cleans up their patch and then just posts a patch to the mailing list one last time with the words, you know, with uh, square brackets committed and said, this is the thing that's going to go in final. And that actually makes it easier from the automation perspective because you can close every version be below that one as superseded and that one patch from a patch tracking perspective gets marked as committed automatically by a patchwork bot that knows that committed means that thing hit the mailing list. So. <laughs> Neil says, I barely like appending the act by reviewed by to the patches before adding them. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. It is it is just a bad habit of changing anything. Um, but I mean, I'm gonna be clear. We justify the bad habit by saying it makes our workflow require one less step, one less post. But man, when I'm at V12 or V13, I'm fine. I'll just I'll, I'll make a slight change. I'll repost it. That gets final act, and then that final thing goes into the series, and I know exactly what I submitted is exactly what went in, and that's like in full transparency. Um, I think we've had problems in the past in our communities where, you know, sometimes maintainers, and I'm not saying, I'm not calling anybody out, but there have been bad habits where maintainers rewrite people, volunteers posted patches, and that is, uh, that's a really bad habit. So, yeah. <laughs> it's a really bad habit, Jeff. I know, I know. So, anyway, we're not, I think we're not here to talk about bad habits, we're here to talk about the positive good habits that the crisper we are about our transition boundaries for patches and getting them in, the better CI CD is going to work for us. And yes, yeah, CI CD is going to take it's going to take resources. And I think you will find that it bears fruit for 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 targeted testing for patches arriving, for linting, for things. It helps the early developers posting patches and and people who might be new to the community posting patches as well. Uh, 
Um, yeah, we've talked a lot about about CI/CD. <laughs> I, um, does anybody have any other questions they want to ask? Non non CI/CD. The floor is wide open. Yeah, we've um, a separate buff if we <laughs> Yeah, so there's a question here from the community with about Neil again about email based workflows tracking feedback. Um yeah. And so I like I'm gonna raise this as I have had reviewers that review that um that have submitted patches to glibc and GCC. We have slightly different workflows in the way we act things, right? And so in GCC it's like you traditionally go like ACK or OK or something like, what does that really mean? Like we don't, we lack crisp boundaries around that review, that patch is reviewed, it was good, I'm OK with it. And I think the Linux kernel ahead of us found that these, these loose boundaries around whether or not a review was OK is, is problematic. And I completely accept the blame in glibc for a consensus-based process where the review is not crisp. I would like to improve in glibc what it means to get a reviewed by tag and if there's at least one reviewed by tag from a, a from a developer you've now got some kind of consensus that that thing's okay and then you know move on. Um, I would like to see the GNU toolchain adopt something like a reviewed by tag because the review by tag makes it incredibly crisp that the reviewer has said, I reviewed it, this looks good, it's it's good for inclusion. And GCC, I think, has the concept of, you know, you've got a global maintainer. So if a global maintainer gives you a reviewed by line, that's that's gold, right? You're you're basically done. Um, and maybe the concept has to come to glibc as well. That even if we've got consensus, we have this notion that subsystem maintainers have have consensus unless someone steps in and says, now nah, that that that's a really bad idea for some reason, um, in which point you know we discussed that something needs to change. Um, so it may be that in glibc we adopt some concept like GCC of a you know subsystem more strongly the concept of the subsystem maintainer, where if you get a reviewed by from the subsystem maintainer, that's that's good to go, right? Like that thing can go into that subsystem. But um, I do think we need we need crisper lines on um, on patch review and patch acceptance. Now, do you think this is a problem in in uh, in C C in GCC, Jason or Jeff or David? I don't see a problem with with you know a a, a global maintainer giving giving the act. Where, where I see one of the issues that I have seen is sometimes it's not clear who can give that. And so the whoever submitted the patch is like, all right, was that okay? was that good to go or not? Because <laughs> I don't know. They may not be as familiar with our processes as we are, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, so that 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 step of how do we go from there's a patch, somebody has reviewed it, even mm -hmm. if they aren't a global reviewer, even if they aren't necessarily a, 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 a have have a, a reviewer status. Um, when is it good to go? And and so sometimes people don't know if they are really good to go at that point. Um, but that's also where I think if we tie this into the patchwork system, there'll be people who are authorized to say this is final, it's good, and then the patch and then the, the patchwork system actually does the commit rather than the uh, maintainer or the end developer. I, I want to get us in terms of, of us doing the cut as much out of this process as we can. Sure, yeah, I, I, but like the that still, I mean, like globally, that still requires someone who has the capacity to push the merge button, basically. Yes, it what, does. What we're right. talking about, right. so Neil's Neil's comment on the on the discussion here is, if there's a person responsible, then that responsible person has to both identify themselves and say this thing is good to go. No matter what process we accept that to happen under, someone someone has effectively what's called decision rights. Right, that person right, has right. decision rights to push the PR, the PR or MR merge button, and in our case right now, it's whomever has GCC or glibc group access on sourceware for Git. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is, is that that gets encoded in 
essentially you'll be authorized in the in the patchwork instance, right? There's an author that you have to authorize. You have to authenticate yourself, correct? Mm -hmm. So there'll be a set of people in patchwork that are 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 marked as these people can act a patch. And so the, any, so once a patch is reviewed, so let's say that uh, you know somebody else reviews it, even if they are not a maintainer, somebody who's authorized to, to send a patch into the tree pushes the button. So he reviewed it, I trust him, good to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, yeah. I mean, that's a process we can, um, but like who would be those people in Brat, like, Brass tacks right now, that's global reviewers. And so well, you question, start with global reviewers and subsystem reviewers. Yeah. But the thing is, aggregating the reviewed buys, I think, helps the global reviewer because global reviewer can then, say, can then say, oh, these three people have reviewed this patch. And you're, you're collecting the reviewed buys, and the reviewed buys automatically aggregate if you use Git PW. You can do it by hand if you want. You can do it by email if you want. And then the global reviewer may just say, that's fine. Like whether or not you adopt an automated process where patchwork auto commits it for you, or whether you just do your normal thing where you commit it, um, I do think patchwork helps because rather than having to do a whole bunch of dances, um, and this is something that the kernel team, kernel people are working on with lore and the before tool, you just need to use git pw. You say git pw series apply. You just do a little test, light testing, and then, get, and then you commit it. So and so git pw. So the only benefit of this is that it will be easier to just say, yeah, whatever, just commit it. That's the only benefit, because everything else we can already do without any hassle. The only benefit of which specific steps? So firstly, Patchwork brings you a place to only, hook up all your CI, CD. That, mm -hmm. uh, that, you, that you can just look at the uh, review by lines, whatever, and then say, mm -hmm. yeah, whatever, then, it's, then it will be okay. No, I will expand on that and say the benefit is that we have a community of developers that I want to grow. I want new volunteers. I want new people coming to the community. I want new people working with us. I want people from other communities yeah. to come and work with us. And those people, yeah, those people will look to our process, yeah. I want more reviewers, people who actually review stuff. Because we need more of those. I agree. So that's, my answer, my, yeah, but my answer to that is that re recording reviewed buys is a positive social incentive for reviewers to put their names on the fact that they reviewed something. And as... Uh, uh, As, uh, to, get, to get it into the repository. That's yes. Kind of, yeah, yep. yeah, that's quite sure. Yeah. They're, they're like, I mean, these are human problems we're dealing with here in terms of motivating people, engaging people, having them uh, develop and use the tools that we have, following the, the founding principles that we have for our FOSS tool chain. And yeah, I think reviewed buys help new reviewers put their name on it and say, I reviewed it. And imagine that after like 100, 200 reviews or something, like Jeff's been looking at this reviewer, always reviewing the subsystem. Then you say, hey, you know, you've been reviewing every patch in the subsystem. I've got a good record of your reviews, right? I don't have to go back to the mailing list and hunt this down. It's much easier to write automated tooling to look at a record of reviews. And I can say, this person has been doing a good job. I've got a track record of reviews there. And then we, we work through that process. Um, yeah, that, so to answer your question, it, there is, you know, we can do a lot of things today um, with the existing tooling we have. I'm looking at what do we, how do we improve this for, for new people? How do we improve this for onboarding, but, for integration? Yeah. But Carlos, how, how do you tell that the person has done a good job without looking at the reviews themselves? If all you look at is a summary and that the stuff gets collected automatically from the reviewed by tags, so that's a great question, Jose. But um, like, I guess ultimately, if you're going to look at someone's work, you can start with the commits. You find all the things that they reviewed, and then you go and you find those reviews as they were done on the list, and then have a look. Uh, it, it's additional metadata that's that's collected. You're right in that you know it, it is only an indicator. You would still have to do an actual review. Yeah, I actually agree with you that uh, reviews 
are a very good way to attract people to become more active. Yeah. I I really would love nothing more than to see people say, "Hey, look, I got I got my I was I've been reviewing these batches." I mean, review is kind of a first step sometimes for people transitioning from uh, early small projects to slightly bigger projects. Um, and I consistently encourage members on my team. The nice thing with patchwork also is I can delegate reviews to members of my team and say, "Hey, look, here's some patches that I think you are you are ready to review in terms of." your skill set, what you've worked on, what subsystems you've looked at, what you've reviewed, and being able to delegate and say, look, here, uh, here are some things I think, I think you could review. So I will say this. For glibc, we started every Monday morning, 9 a.m. Eastern, we do community patch queue review, which is walk the queue of patches for the community and say, anybody interested in reviewing this or reviewing that or reviewing this, and we try to get volunteers to review those patches and we record the delegates and we I, I take notes and I submit them and we've been doing that for months now and I I feel like it has borne positive fruit in terms of um, getting things through the review queue where I think where it hasn't helped it probably hasn't helped get new reviewers but I think to get new reviewers I have to add more clarity to how this process works and probably publish some updates for the contribution checklist uh, a comment as Myself as a potential reviewer, the challenges I see I'm facing are first, I have my own, uh, you know, job-based uh, deadlines. Some interesting patch comes in that I might be qualified to review, but I may not be able to look at it for several days. And then I'm unsure as to whether it's even worth looking at because maybe somebody else has almost finished reviewing it. I don't have any clarity about other people working on it. And the second part of that is, am I qualified to review it? Uh, take Malik, for example. I've looked at Malik quite a bit, but I don't consider myself fully qualified or fully expert on all aspects of Malik. It's a pretty big code base just within that little subsystem. Uh, so I'm not going to be quick to review some other code. I'm going to have to do some study of some corner of Malik that I had not looked at before. Uh, and Patrick, to answer your question, I think you're fully qualified and completely <laughs> qualified to look at that code and say, at an architect, like, does this make sense? Like at a high level, does the architecture look okay? Are the details okay? And if you gave a reviewed by to some other person's malloc patch, that would immediately draw my attention to the fact that I should go look at this. And you should get your reviewed by recorded in, in that review so that when Elena asks you what you've been doing, you can tell, you can look, I reviewed this patch and it was good for this and it's good for these customers and good for this use case. So yeah. that you also can have like some, some justification for your, you know, like uh, for our, our um, you know, our patrons who are supporting the FOSS tool chains. Yes, uh, that, that brings up another challenge for FOSS in general is there's, even a greater distance in FOSS between the developer and the customers than in a um, cor corporate closed software. That, you know, I can see something needs to be fixed just because I've been a developer and so I, that ought to be fixed. Uh, but I may not know, well, I sure don't know a significant part of the, of the user base. It's such a large user base, it's hard to know who might use it. I think that's okay, Patrick. I think that you are present, and I'm going to go on a limb and say that with your corporate connections and the work that you're doing, you you do have contact with customers. You do have engagement with those customers in downstream. So I think, if anything, your presence in these upstream communities brings a little bit of those customers, uh, those stakeholders' priorities upstream to say, hey, you know, I know people who are using this because I get to see them in my day-to-day -day job and they tie into them. Yes, we will have other users. Yes, we have other people, but we also have other connections with them. Um, I think, for example, that the use cases in GUIX are very interesting to the GNU toolchain. GUIX with its bootstrap seed and with the, with the reproducible builds that it has, very relevant to me. And there are times when I've interacted with Ludovic Cortez over... Uh, LD audit issues and how to use LD audit to build fake routes and things like that. So there are other users like GUIX, and I think we are integrating with them. 
And the way that we do that is by making sure that all of us, GCC, GDB, uh, Bin Utils, and GLibc, have some distro contacts. Right? So I think it's really important that we speak with the distributions and then we talk to the distros and we make sure that, that we understand how they're using our tools because our primary users are actually our distros. And then after that, we've got all the users that are using the distros. Um, and so we need, we need that integration point. I guess I'm just a little spoiled. Some, several jobs ago, I worked for a, smart, a startup that had uh, a customer base of fewer than 1,000 and a total employee count of fewer than 500. And I had frequent close contact uh, with any customer complaints. They came quickly all the way back to the developers, uh, which just doesn't happen in large organizations in the same way. Yeah, <laughs> I like honestly, I think our direct integration point there is GNU, GUIX, Debian, Gentoo, Fedora, RHEL, SUSE, Ubuntu, right? Having that direct integration point with the distros is in is, in my opinion, incredibly useful to ask them, how are you deploying this? How are you using it? What flags have you turned on the compilers? What are your default flag settings? What are you building with? What are you testing with? Is it just O2? Is it not? Did you build glibc with bind now? Did you build glibc with enabling CET? Did you build on the experimental uh, malloc changes for, um, you know, for pack BTI? Like, there's a lot of things that, you know, we can gain by talking to our distribution. Right, so and and, that, to, and to make sure that I'm not being totally negative here, mm -hmm. the positive side is we've probably had more than 500 people do code commits in this last year. And that small startup that we didn't have, um, you know, in the tool chain alone, we probably only had about 50 people uh, in that. Uh, so we can do way more stuff with FOSS, uh, with this FOSS organization, the way it's been built, than... Uh, than a small company could touch. So there, there are advantages and drawbacks to everything. And mm. we, I see potential for this to continue to be the leading uh, tool mm. chain in FOSS. Yeah. In, in my opinion, because, well, sorry, Carlos, I don't want to- No, no, go ahead, Jose, go ahead. Um, you know, when it comes to review buys, I mean, I understand that you are considering the reviews to be sort of a, a what a first step into getting more involved, right, in development and even maintainership, correct? Yes, and I have more uh, I more ideas on that. But anyway, continue. Yeah, but consider the perspective of someone who actually joins uh, a mailing list of GCC or Binutils or any of our projects. Reviews are traditionally are in practice made by maintainers so to new, to newcomers reviewing is an activity that what they see today in the mailing list is that who 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 does the reviews the maintainers right so i think people associate immediately reviewing as to maintainers which are, i mean which is the end of the scale right i mean mm -hmm. if you want to reviews to be the first step of the scale uh, somehow we have to remove this impression on people that it's actually an activity made by the people at the end of the scale, right? Which is maintainers. Because I have seen people um, who actually have had sent patches to GCC in particular and other pro programs. They got the patches accepted. Still, it is so difficult to convince, to convince them to review patches sent by other people. I don't know if it is shyness. I don't know if they feel that they are not qualified, as Patrick just said uh, minutes ago. I don't know. But I mean, I agree with the idea that reviews could be a good first activity for newcomers. It, but it, It's not necessarily a great first activity. I mean, like the first activities are obviously simple patches, right? Actually making changes. And once right. you've made changes and you begin to understand a subsystem, then you can begin to do reviews. Um, and I've had people go through that process. now. Not everybody is interested in doing reviews. And right. so the, the thing that I'm, I want to encourage is there's the submit patch. Well, the camera's gone backwards. There's submit patches, start doing reviews, and then move to maintainer. Um, that process is not as well spelled out in our communities as it might be. And that's okay. But 
to give a contrast, um, I was speaking extensively with uh, Victor Stinner over what the Python community does. And in the Python community, there's definitely a process of um, coaching and mentorship that leads towards being uh, being a developer or a maintainer. And there's clarity over how that works. Um, there's some discussions about whether someone, uh, you know, is is ready to be a maintainer for the system. We have a we have a little bit of that in GCC and in glibc, and we have we have some of it kind of written out. If I think it, with a little more structure, we might get to the point where we can make it clearer that we are definitely looking for reviews from new developers, and that practicing reviews, if that's something interesting for you, is a great way to hone your skills. Because boy, when you have to review someone else's work, you have no idea what they're talking about. It really makes you think about what does this code really do? Where is it going? Why does it function this way? What's the <laughs> yeah. what's the intent? What's the expectations? And so I think it would be great to outline a, like a, a bit of a broader process for how you kind of grow in the community. Um, and I think we have it. I think glibc has some of it in the maintainers file, and I think GCC has some of it in the um, in 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 the maintainers file as well. So I think a little more work there would be great. But recording them, I think um, reviewed by, and you know ac accepting that reviewed by is the way we would do things. Given that reviewed by has value for for the for the process and helps the automation as well. So does that answer your question, Jose? That I, I think it's not the first step. It's an intermediate step, probably. Okay, that, that makes more sense to me. Because, and that, yeah, go ahead. No, well, that reviewing sucks. It is boring. It is um, actually not that easy. And uh, yeah, I don't yeah. want to review patches. I have to, but I hate it. And I, they were, I fully expect it. People on my team at Red Hat are just like when I tell them, "Look, I've assigned you some patches to review. You have to review them. It's part of your. It's part of the way we're going to help the upstream community." Um, that they may not like it either, but I think it really grows you as a developer when you're when you have to review somebody else's work. Now, it's not for everybody, right? I'm not. I'm not saying that everybody has to do this. It's simply that, like, if we had a path to grow reviewers, the path is. Uh, is a social one. It's a technical one. It's make it easy for the reviewers to review patches. Make it so that the reviewers have positive incentive, get their names recorded, so that 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 process works. So that when Patrick reviews a patch, it gets recorded as reviewed by from Patrick, and then Patrick can say, "Look, this is a thing that I got done, and it and it has a record, and and you just keep growing. It snowballs. There's a social snowball effect there when you're a reviewer. It feels great to review more things and get thanked for the review that you do." even though it's hard and not often that much fun. Yeah, I agree. And I'm sorry because I'm supposed to be reviewing a patch from Florian right now, and I'm in this panel, so. <laughs> I think Arjun has a question, Arjun. Uh, Arjun's on my team, yeah, Arjun. What was Arjun's question? I make Arjun review patches same. all the time. <laughs> Arjun, what do you want to say? Okay, look. Uh, um, hey, uh, oh, unfortunately, Keith is listen only. Kevin, Simon, from the GDB side, what do you guys think about patch reviews and this whole process? I mean, like, we're a lot of GCC, GLibc people, but, like, I really want to hear from GDB about patch review. We did, I mean, between GDB and glibc, we did the Garrett experiment where we tried to like work through using Garrett for reviews. Boy, Garrett is just too hard, I think. It doesn't quite solve the problem we want. It's not as flexible as we wanted it to be. Um, I'd love to hear from Simon and Kevin about patch reviews in GDB. Yeah, man, Joel's online as well. Joel oh, I didn't see Joel. Yeah. Um, for me, the hardest part is uh, keeping track of which patches have been reviewed, uh, which one is the last one, uh, the one of the series, right? Like, uh, this is the hardest part. Uh, after that, uh, I do prefer a web-based interface for reviewing because you can expand the patch, you can look at where it is, look at the context or more context. Uh, but yeah, at, at Edacore, we use Garrett, and we don't find it hard at all. So I think it's a question of, of learning the technology. 
the problem is that uh, every one of us has their own you know technology so uh, adding one more to learn can be a bit of a uh, of an obstacle let's say for for people to to use the system because uh, I, I admit that for Garrett at least uh, a lot of people say oh you know at the beginning it's kind of confusing a little bit the uh, workflow and things like this so you have to uh, get into it but uh, I, I would love to have us to for us to centralize a little bit more of the uh, the patches so that we can uh, process the information automatically, build list. I love also the fact that you've, you guys have done in uh, GMC about uh, every week we go through the patch view and you know, start talking about who takes what patch. But then it becomes uh, a lot clearer uh, what uh, your responsibilities are. Yeah. So I guess, Joel, a question for you then. Does patchwork give enough value for the cost, which is you can tell people, clean up your queue so that I can review your patches, is often the incentive to say, if your queue's clean and you've got the latest version in your patch in your queue, then I can review whatever patch you've got in your queue. And likewise, delegates can be recorded in the patchwork queue to know who's reviewing the patch so that when you have that community conversation over, I'm going to review this patch, you put your name behind it, and you're the one who's doing the review until it's done. Does, is, there, is there enough value in that, do you think, it's hard for me to uh, answer the uh, the question uh, for because I haven't used Patchwork very much. Um, I think uh, from a procedural standpoint, uh, uh, probably you know like uh, we if we adopt that system, we need to be uh, clear about it and then make it work. Like we have to make an effort, um, and I think that's what's been lacking probably in the past. Also, from my perspective, and that might be unfair, so you know others will comment, but. I think uh, there's a fairly significant resistance to change uh, in our group. And adopting new processes and things like this uh, requires a lot of effort, a lot of energy uh, to push. And, uh, you know, because we all work a little bit differently, uh, we haven't been very successful at uh, adopting new, new changes. I agree. And I think my intent with and the intent of, because I think GDB adopted Patchwork before GLibc started doing anything with it, the intent for Patchwork has been as thin as possible while providing structure that we can build upon for the community for patch review, for patch delegation, for keeping patch queues clean, for understanding what's the next patch. Uh, Simon, you wanted to make comments, and I know I, I saw you unmute. Uh, yeah, so um, it was back when you were talking about Garrett and so, well, so many of you know that I quite like Garrett. That's why I, I try to push it. And yeah, I just think it a, a system like that solves many of the problems that have been uh, mentioned today, like connecting Garrett to a uh, ECI system and having that ECI system like pull the change. That's a hundred times easier. Sorry about the <laughs> noise. Uh, it makes it the makes it a lot easier than trying to have a system pull patches from a mailing list and have it not apply. And even for humans, like there there are many hurdles to reviewing and like I try to review a lot of patches and for example, just a newcomer sends a patch and the patch is not uh, like formatted properly because they sent it from Outlook or whatever. Like I have to repeat that a hundred times a year and that's that's one of the like the things that deter me a bit from your reviewing. So you have to kind of train people all the time, whereas like pushing a git commit, they cannot really get it wrong. Uh, other than that, uh, like just seeing the, another thing that I don't like from reviewing is reviewing different versions. When I, like there's a big patch, it's like mostly okay. If it's from a, if I do comments and it's from a, another maintainer, I, I'll trust them that they change it. They, they just changed like what I ask and I don't have to check the whole new version. But from somebody we don't know, like I I want to see what's the, the difference between your V2 and V4 and like Garrett makes that really easy. Like I can check the latest version in, in, in two minutes and that's it. Whereas if it's on the main list, I have to reread the whole patch and like I don't really want to do that. It's so so uh, yeah. there is a tooling aspect there, right? So with patchwork you can just say you can get PW pull down a series and get PW pull down the second series, and then actually you do a local diff, and the local diff can show That's you. That's if it was sent properly. And but but if the if the patchwork tribot that doesn't apply doesn't doesn't work, you tell the contributor 
you did not meet our re minimum requirements for this thing applying. <laughs> it's just a it's just a machine. It's just a tool. Can you please resend with the patch uh, fixed properly? And so you kind of you kind of step back from it. And the the tribot that does the patch application, it does it in the way that we all expect the patch should be applied and it should work. And that that becomes the rubric against which you can tell contributors like. Go look at your patch in the queue. If it didn't apply and the tribot didn't apply it, then you need to go fix the way that patch. If that bug is automated, like that, I would be very happy. Yeah. It is well, so it's automated for glibc right now. And in fact, every time we get patches that don't apply, it's it's usually because someone did something weird with the patch. And then I just reply and say, look, patchwork says it doesn't apply. You got to resubmit. And they're like, oh, I didn't know. And they fix it up or or their patches for example that are cross posted from LK, from the uh, kernel or from the um, linux man pages project in which case i we nuke them out of the uh, patchwork tree mm -hmm. and so then yeah, good from but uh, for the v3 versus uh, version 4 review that really doesn't solve the problem if you have sufficiently high development activity because uh, Patrick doesn't tell you the base commit to which you should apply your patch. And even if, if it applies in the past, it won't apply when you're doing your diff, if there's sufficiently high activity. And this is solved by B4, I think, to some extent. But, what is that? Yeah. B4 is what uh, some kernel developers use in in instead of uh, patchwork, it goes to law.kernel.org and can do fancy stuff with uh, patches collected from mailing lists there. Yes, the answer is there are race conditions in patch submission and application. And unless your submission includes a commit upon which the submission was done, in the current CI CD system we have for glibc, we try to guess based on time at which you sent it. So we're hoping that the time at which you hit git send email was close enough to your tree that we try an application. But yeah, it's not perfect. Um, and that's the part that annoys me. It's we spend so much time trying to do heuristic and guessing and things when, like in my mind, this other system just gets it right 100% of the time. So like I'm, I'm a bit, like I don't want to work on trying to do so I'm guessing, I feel it's just like a, a lost cause because it will always fail somewhere or another. That's my feeling. I, I hear you. I think the, the issue is that there's a pluralist of workflows and a pluralist of views in here yeah. for, which, for which email applies best. And what we want to do is move just one step forward. And so if Patchwork, for example, has a 99% success rate and a 1% fail rate for applying your patch just because it happens to have had a race condition, I'm okay with that because it really helps in all the other cases. I agree. Yeah. Um, there, there was a question uh, about Mark, and, and I do want to answer that. And Mark, you did say it's a big question. How is the relationship of the steering committees uh, with the FSF, and how do the steering committees get new fresh members? That is a great uh, question. I think I, I can speak for myself, have a positive relationship with the FSF. We have engaged uh, the FSF on various topics, asking for uh, help in various areas. Um, and I, I don't think that there's, there's any, um, anything else I would say about that. Um, but getting new, fresh steering members, committee members, that's a question of, uh, of governance. And I think that's a really big topic. And I think we should talk about that on the mailing lists. So I think if you have questions, start with a public conversation. Start from a, a place of honesty. And we will try all to give you your answers for the questions that you have. And we'll do it on the public mailing lists in a public and transparent way. Yeah, we're not going to cover that in one minute. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah I, I, I mean, that was really good. I mean, I, I, it's a really good conversation. I mean, thanks for all of this about uh, CICD and the bots. I mean, this maybe should have been a, a BOF separate from this and not uh, be the uh, GCC steering committee meeting, but lots of good information to to cover about this and good for project for how the, uh, the community moves forward with uh, testing patches and reviewing patches. Patch um, review is a traditional the... topic for for. <laughs> it is. It is. 
We are, up for, I mean, up at the top, and we have another uh, presentation. When when are we going to convert to Git? Oh, wait, we did it already. Uh, a year ago. <laughs> so anyways, again, thanks very much to you know, the all, all the panel members, all the people who serve on the GCC steering committee and the various stewards, and especially all the developers who we're representing, you know, great amount of, of progress this year. I mean, I can't call out everybody individually, but there's been a lot of really excellent progress and, and excellent functionality contributed to all these projects. So, so thanks very much. And thanks for joining the uh, GCC steering committee and GNU stewards uh, Q&A panel. And uh, it's, again, it's a very uh, good question for Mark. And we can, as, as Carlos was saying, we're maintaining a lot of us, uh, you know, communication with the FSF and trying to have a, a, a balance between the uh, requirements of the, the community and various developers and, and the FSF going forward. Um, and, and sort of create a, a, a new uh, a new path forward for for all of us to succeed.